first webinar under our three-part series on biocontrol. The series is a collaboration between the ASEAN Action Plan on Fall Armyworm and CARBI. My name is Alison. Um, I'll be your moderator for today's webinar, and I'm joined by some wonderful speakers uh, and also our technical support expert, Pranav. So um, you would have seen this hopefully just before. It's just a few um, quick pointers. Any technical issues, try logging off or on or send a message to Grow Asia or Pranav in the chat box. Um, you use the Q&A box to ask speakers to the questions. You can use chat just to give us um, a heads up about a point that you wish to share or a link or highlight something or say thanks or great speech. Um, make sure if you can to rename yourself under the little tab there that says more. You can go in there and you can use um, perhaps your name and give your organization. So if you do want to talk or ask a question, we know exactly who you are. And five there is if you really have a burning question or really want to say something, um, you can put your hand up and we'll try to give you the chance to do so. Um, it's not quite that I've just been told I, I haven't quite updated the, the proper names of the presentation. So don't look too hard at, at, at those titles. Most of them are right, but, but it's really just to give you an idea that we're moving at a pace today. We've got lots to share and what we really want to do is use this as a catalyst for further discussion in the ASEAN Action Plan on Fall Armyworm as a way of thinking about what could we be looking about um, going forward uh, regarding projects on biocontrol. Um, I've just got a quick poll here just to see who we are. We've got um, 347 um, people that have registered, which is fantastic. So Pranav, can you launch the poll? We've got 150 people with us so far. If you could choose, the host and panelists ca cannot vote. So if you're a panelist, I'm sorry, um, you'll have to just resist that urge to choose one of those options. I'm gonna give people just maybe five or six seconds more. And then we'll get an early indication of who is with us on the call. Pranav? Oh, great. Oh, wow. that's quite a spread. Yeah. We, haven't, we haven't got any farmers or growers. So we're going to have to work on that, I think, for next time, because that would be um, really great to see some people from that um, stakeholder group. But that's really, really good to see the spread there between government, research, private, and... Um, that's fantastic. It's, it's virtually, it's pretty even actually. Okay, so next slide. Let me see if I can do that. Uh, I don't know, I think the poll has to close for that. Let's have a look. Okay, I'd like to introduce now Graham Dixie, the Executive Director of Grow Asia, just to give a few thoughts and an introduction to today's session. Graham? Thank you, Alison. And, and uh, thank you for this incredible response. Um, 347 people registering is amazing. And looking at the bottom there, I see the numbers rising up with every second. And I, and I guess there's two reasons for that. One is, is the really impressive job that Alison did in, in drawing together such a, a community of interested in, and practitioners around this particular issue. Uh, and the other side is just what a big issue this is. And we did some rough calculations and, and you know, if, if, if it hits Southeast Asia, anything like as badly as it hit Africa, this could cause over $800 million worth of damage. And that's money taken out of the pockets of smallholder farmers. And it would be foreign exchange that would need to be expended from the region to import additional corn. The, um, what has been interesting about this whole piece is that this is the first time the ASEAN has actually thought about collective handling and tackling these regional issues. Um, I had the privilege of having to present to the senior um, officials from the ministries of agriculture across all the regions, plus the assistant director general of the ASEAN um, secretariat. And the point that came out from them was that they were very excited about this whole approach, partly because this was the first time that they were really converting something which the ministers had come up with into something that was now bottom-up development and was now actually rolling out. But they saw the potential in it and they saw the potential that if we could prove that regionally we can work well together, if we can share information, if we can exchange new practices, best practices, if we can draw into our region global best practices, if we can make the research and the communication more cost-effective, 
this would be a really big first for the ASEAN and for the region. And, and the second piece was that they said, if you can make this work, this would be really important going forward because the, certainly the consultations that we've had across the sector is these kind of extreme events, whether they're pests or disease or climate, but in, in our case, pests and diseases, these are likely to happen more often. And, and the point they raised to us was, you know, what ha would happen if um, the desert locust arrives here? How would we respond? And if we have a mechanism of a community of practice of doing the things that have been set out in that um, regionally developed bottom-up action plan, then we have a much better chance of handling it. So it's not only an exciting launch, but it is also something that we need to now prove that we can function together and that we can learn from one another and we can come up with a modus operandi which works regionally. Uh, I think that's all I need to really say, Alison, but uh, I, look, I look forward to this enormously. Excellent, Graham, and thank you very much. And I'd just like to also thank um, uh, not only Kabi, who has done this in conjunction with um, Grow Asia and, and the ASEAN Secretariat as well, um, I'd like to thank. Um, they're very um, important to, to this whole process uh, and all the members of ASEAN that have supported that. So a big shout out to those that have joined us from the ASEAN Working Group on Crops and also the uh, Expert Working Group on Phytosanitary Measures. It's a pleasure to have you join us. Now, Roger, you uh, is now joining us. Roger is from Kabi, who we've done this in collaboration with. So welcome, and I'm going to give you the floor and turn off my screen. Thanks very much, Alison, and uh, I'll just turn my video off now that you've seen me and know a little bit what I look like, so I'll turn off. Um, yes, thanks, Alison and Graham. We're very pleased to be um, co-hosting this series of webinars with you, which is looking at biological control. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, sorry. Can I have the next slide? <laughs> yes, I'm... <laughs> Biological control, uh, I think most of us know what we're talking about, although different people refer to different aspects of biocontrol, but basically it's using living organisms to control our pest. And we talk about natural enemies, which may be predators, parasitoids, pathogens. Um, in the case of an insect like fall armyworm, the natural enemies we're talking about are usually arthropods, other insects, um, or microbes, pathogens. And biocontrol is probably best looked at as the basis for integrated pest management, which everybody agrees is the approach, the overall approach we should be looking at. So in our webinars, we're going to be looking at the different uh, types of biocontrol. Um, and I've listed four there. So conservation is the first level, and that's basically encouraging the natural enemies that are already in the habitat through managing the habitat, also avoiding killing them. So things like spraying will kill the natural enemies as well as the pests. Augmentation is about uh, releasing large numbers of natural enemies that we've reared specifically to release, uh, to boost the populations that are already there. There's a category of biocontrol, which some people say isn't properly biocontrol, but we're covering it here, and that's biopesticides. And these are products which are based usually on some kind of insect pathogen that we can spray like a pesticide, but which are based on living organisms. And then lastly, there's classical biocontrol, which we're going to be talking about more today, where we introduce a natural enemy that isn't already present and, and often this is introduced from the area that the pest originates. Next slide, please. So in, in getting biocontrol used, I just want to highlight a number of areas we need to think about. As scientists, we tend to look first at the effectiveness. Does it work? Um, and, and we say how much mortality a natural enemy might be causing, but we do need to go beyond mortality. We need to think about whether it's reducing the farmer's losses. But there are various other things other than just the question as to whether the natural enemy causes mortality. We need to look at the regulatory context. Some of these approaches have uh, regulations governing them to make sure that we do it safely, so we need to think about that aspect and we need to uh, 
use international guidelines and standards where appropriate. We need to think about the practicalities too. Some biocontrol approaches might be a little bit difficult and impractical maybe for smallholders. And we also need to take into account gender considerations here. So, so social science is as important as the biological science. And lastly, we need to also think about economics. Are, are the approaches we're proposing cost effective? Um, it's very easy to say we've got a natural enemy that kills lots of pests, but can we use it economically? Is it cost effective? So I hope we'll think about these different aspects as we go through our, our webinar series. And, it, and to get all these done requires collaboration. And, and we'll be hearing more about this as we go through our webinar series. But I would just highlight this uh, research collaboration portal for Fall Army Worm, which you can, can look at later and perhaps participate in. Thank you, Alison. Thank you, Roger, very much. And, and that was some very good thoughts there to um, take forward into the discussion after our presentations around uh, the feasibility, effectiveness, um, gender issues, for example, to consider. I'm now going to introduce our first speaker today, Dr. Mark Kennis from Carby. Mark is an entomologist with over 30 years of experience in applied and environmental entomology. And he's currently leading the risk analysis invasion ecology section at Carby in Switzerland. And has been working on fall armyworm biocontrol over the last three years. Um, Mark, you have the floor. I'll just move on to your first slide. Okay, thank you, Alison, and, and hello, everyone. I'm glad to see so many people connected. I will stop my video as well. You can already go to the next slide, Alison. So, um, so here we're going to talk about classical biological control. And as Roger said, uh, it, uh, so classical biocontrol is the introduction of a natural enemy of exotic origin to control a pest, usually also exotic, aiming at a permanent control of the pest. I'm not going to go to, through all the protocol because it takes too long, but uh, this implies a few important things. First, it implies collaboration and work in the area of origin of the pest or in a country that has already introduced the natural enemy. You cannot do classical biocontrol in your own country without collaboration. It also implies introduction of exotic uh, organisms, which involves, of course, some risks of non-target effects. Thus, risk assessments need to be uh, made, in, including uh, a following regulation, national regulation and including uh, quarantine facilities and so on. But one of the biggest advantage of classical biological control in contrast to uh, the most other control method is that there is no need for repeated uh, actions, which means often huge benefits because the control is continuing year after year without further cost if the natural enemy is well established and works by itself. Next slide. Uh, of course, um, I'm working more in uh, in Africa for the moment on the, on the fall army worm. Uh, and of course in Africa, uh, the main example of success in classical biological control against an agricultural pest is against cassava millibug, another uh, South American species. I'm not going to talk too much about uh, this now because uh, I know that in the following talk, there will be uh, more data on, on, this, uh, on this immense success because this, was, uh, this had the following, uh, the introduction in um, in Africa dates from the 80s, but uh, much later it was also introduced and successfully controlled in Southeast Asia. Uh, next slide. But there are of course many other examples of success of classical biological control. Uh, we have counted that until 2010, we have a database at Kebi and have counted that about 700 insect pests have been targets of classical biocontrol projects worldwide and 27% uh, of the insects were controlled. This may look not that high, but this also includes projects that didn't uh, finish or that were not uh, carried out properly. If you take only the, the, the good programs, the successes is usually higher. Next slide. 
Of course, the next question then is, can these successes like the, the one on the cassava minibug be repeated for four armyworm? Well, I will be totally honest here. And I have to say that it's a bit more difficult than other uh, uh, targets like, like the cassava minibug. First, fall armyworm is a pest in its area of origin. Many of these targets were not pests like the cassava minibug. So of course, by introducing a natural enemy from the region of introduction, you can expect uh, success. Here, it's a bit more complicated because it's also a pest in its area of origin. Secondly, in America, fall armyworm natural enemies do not seem to play a major role. If you look into the, the literature, there are lots of papers mentioning low parasitism rate, for example, but I can say already now, I mean, I, I will be speaking a bit more about that later, but uh, I can say already now that there are bias in the, in the literature, which probably underestimate the effect of natural enemies in in the Americas. And finally, in Africa and Asia, fall armyworm is already attacked by a complex of parasitoids and other natural enemies, which is not always the case in classical biocontrol. And of course, you have to take this into account not to introduce natural enemies that will compete too much with the already uh, established uh, natural enemies. Next slide, please. But I think it's really worth trying still, despite all these uh, uh, difficulties. Next slide. And the first reason, of course, is that fall armyworm is a huge pest with serious impacts on livelihoods, including human health. Nobody will contradict that. Uh, next slide. And uh, we can also argue that even a general decrease of population level by 10, 20, 30% would have huge benefits because it is a huge pest, which is widespread throughout uh, two or three different continents. Um, it means also that the con total control is not necessary. Minor damage usually does not result in yield losses. So if you can lower the damage just by 10, 20%, you may reach a threshold where you have, for example, to, to diminish by half the amount of pesticide use, which across uh, uh, these different continents would be a, an immense success. Next slide. Also, population levels are definitely lower in the Americas. This is not always clear because it's also a pest there, but I've worked in uh, both in, in the America, in Latin America and uh, in, uh, in uh, Africa. And I can ensure you that populations in, uh, in smallholder fields in America without pesticides are less damaged than in Africa. I'm not so sure about Southeast Asia because I don't know the, the situation very well here. And next slide. And, fi and finally, we have to say that following classical biological control, some invasive pests have become less damaging in the area of introduction than in the area of origin. This is not uncommon. This has happened in several cases, and we may expect this also with fall army worm. Who knows? Next slide. Of course, if we have to introduce a natural enemy from the Americas, we have to see which ones is or are the best. Fall armyworm has many natural enemies in America. If you, can, if you look into the literature, there are lots of parasitoids lists, predators, pathogens, and so on. Predators we don't really consider in this program because the predators of fall armyworm are all uh, highly uh, polyphagous. Some predators, of other pests can be very specific and can be used, but in our case, we have to focus on parasitoids, which in, in many cases are more, more specific than predators, at least on fall armyworm. Next slide. But we still have to see how we select the parasitoids. And there are, of course, different criteria because there is, if you look into the literature, there are at least two dozens of, uh, of parasitoids listed uh, as, as parasitoids of fall armyworm. And the first criterion, of course, is uh, the impact in the area of origin. It's better to introduce a parasitoid that has already an impact in the Americas. But I have to say here that many literature data on parasitism in the Americas underestimate parasitism, as we can see with our ongoing studies, simply because parasitized larvae don't do much damage, they don't feed a lot, they, they pupate much earlier, which means uh, that the damage is not visible and there is a strong bias in the surveys and sampling towards healthy larvae. Next slide. Another very important criterion is the, the specificity. You cannot introduce parasitoids which you will know, which, which are, are are likely to have uh, important uh, non-target effects. But there are parasitoids from the, in the literature, at least, that are 
known or thought to be uh, specific to fall armyworm. There are two on the screens for the moment. And possibly there are also many other cases of sibling species or host specific biotypes of apparently polyphagous uh, parasitoids. So this needs to be further investigated, of course, in the lab, but also in, uh, in the field, if possible, in, uh, in the area of origin. Next slide. Another criterion which needs to be taken into account is the, the empty niches in the parasitoid complex in Africa and Asia. And, and there we have a very good example. The most abundant and frequent parasitoid of uh, fall armyworm in the Americas is Chelonus insularis. It's a braconid, which of course would be the best candidate for introduce at first, but, but also in Africa and Asia, we have uh, different species of Chelonus, which are also the main parasitoids of the, the recently introduced uh, pest, which means that there may be some competitions going on uh, between the, these, these two very similar species. Next slide. And finally, we also have to look at the uh, uh, climate matching. For example, we may need different parasitoids or different biotypes of the same parasitoid species if we introduce in subtropical areas or in tropical areas, for example. Next slide. So what are we doing for the moment at CABI? Uh, well, we have started uh, surveys in uh, Latin America a couple of years ago with local partner, with national partners, mainly in Bolivia and Nicaragua, also in Brazil, in, in Peru, in uh, Ecuador and Colombia, and have found uh, very interesting uh, uh, data, which I don't want to detail here, but uh, may detail later in, uh, in another talk. Uh, next slide, please. And this has resulted in the, in the importation into our quarantines in Switzerland of two parasitoids, uh, which are presently the target of uh, specificity study, biological and ecological studies. This is Chelonus insularis because it is the main parasitoids in most countries in Latin America and uh, Aphosomala figmae, which is the, the most abundant, apparently specific parasitoid of fall armyworm. Chelonus insularis is not totally specific to, to fall armyworm. So we are focusing on these two species. I can already say that Aphosomala figmae has already now been uh, sent to our quarantine facilities in Pakistan for further studies, further uh, screening tests on non-target species in uh, in, uh, in South Asia and it will be sent as well uh, in, uh, in Africa, uh, in Kenya and possibly Benin uh, in the next months. Next slide. Yes, I want, sorry, I just wanted to say that we, we had planned to, to introduce more, uh, to import more species, but because of COVID, it's very difficult for the moment to, to, to ship a parasitoids and to travel there and so and things like this. So that's why for the moment we are focusing on these two ones, but, but hopefully we can Im import two or three more species for further studies later on. So this is the, the last slide. What can we do uh, in, uh, in an ASEAN context? Um, well, of course we can take advantage of the ongoing projects. It, this means that a classical biocontrol program in the region would not have to be started from scratch. Uh, we have already uh, further data on the natural enemies in Latin America and on the on the specificity of, of some of the main parasitoids. So of course we can use these data to to progress faster. But still, there are still a few things that need to be investigated uh, in Southeast Asia. The first thing, of course, is the native parasitoids that need to be uh, known. The, those are already attacking fall armyworm because this is a very important data before you introduce exotic parasitoids. You need to know what is the, the native uh, natural enemy complex that already attacking fall armyworm. We also have to look at potential non-target effects on native species, which may be different from, uh, from East Asia and Africa. Climate matching, as I said, is an important uh, matter as well. And of course, we have to look at uh, the regulations that are in place in the region. And with this, I have uh, finished and I thank you all for your attention and uh, would welcome any question. Great, thank you very much, Mark. If you could put your camera on, um, that would be appreciated. Yes. 
And I have a few questions. I'm just going to direct people. If you do have a question, could you please put it in the question and answer box? The chat is um, there. It's very useful as well, but it would help us if you put it in the Q&A. Um, so with that, I have a few questions coming through and I, I think you've sort of already answered this, but I'm going to answer it again. Uh, sorry, ask it again. Um, in Asia, we have full armyworm in diverse environments. Do you suggest introduction of exotic natural enemies or search for native natural enemies in the ASEAN context? Well, at first, uh, before introducing exotic natural enemies, we need to know what what is the the native natural enemies that have adopted the, the invasive species. I think it's important because it also somehow has an influence on the selection of species. And this is also important for the, the follow-up studies after the introduction. So this is the first step to be done uh, right, Thanks, uh, right now before the introduction. And I think you had that in, the, in those steps, you sort of put out that that is the first step and then looking at potential non-target effects, climate matching, regulations and quarantine facilities, et cetera. How long does it take to sort of move <laughs> through those steps? I mean, I know that there's no one answer there, but could you give me a bit of an indication of, are we looking at years of work or, or could we do something quite rapidly or what's, what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, of course, uh, these are, these are insects which develop quite rapidly in comparison to species that are, for example, univoltine and take a long time. So it can be fast, but it's a question of means uh, of, of funding. And of, it's not always easy to get that kind of funding for research, simply because uh, um, a research is not so easy to be funded in, uh, in this kind of, uh, of program. But of course, yeah, uh, to give an indication, we started our surveys for natural enemies in uh, in Latin America about two years ago. Now we are in the in the um, in the step of uh, testing the the species in the countries, and we can expect the next year to release a, the first parasitoid if everything goes well. So it would have taken three years, but of course for Asian countries it would it can be much faster because we have already all the data on the on the main parasitoids now. So it can be in one or two years. Excellent. Um, you mentioned something further, uh, sort of earlier in your presentation around the literature data on parasitism, um, underestimating that. How, how do you address that bias that, that you've noticed? Or how do you think that could be addressed, that underestimation? Well, by doing uh, uh, new new assessments uh, using different protocols. Um, we we take this into account uh, in the in in our African studies, and this is why uh, we often have in African studies parasitism rates which are higher than uh, those mentioned in the literature in from the Americas. So uh, this can be uh, sometimes uh, surprising, but I think it's also because we are doing things in a different ways. The, yeah, there. Are, there are protocols to do that. I mean, uh, yeah. Excellent. Is. Okay. Um, I have a question here from um, uh, Muni Rangaswamy, uh, and it is, what do you think about Talinormus rumus? It was introduced from Asia to Americas for classical biological control of full army women in the past. What do you think of the potential of using it here? Well, well, Telenomus ramus has never become uh, an important uh, parasitoid in the Americas occurring naturally. It can be used as augmentative biocontrol agent, but in the in the field, it's 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 a minor parasitoid. But um, uh, it has um, in Africa data for the moment uh, show that uh, it. It is it is a uh, it is a parasitoid. It is a frequent parasitoid of um, of the full army worm. But but Telenomus ramus uh, is not uh, going is not considered for classical biological control because it is it's it is easy. present in all the regions where uh, where uh, full army worm occur. It's it, it's present in Asia, in Africa, in. Uh, in the Americas, so it, it can be used uh, as an augmentative biocontrol agent, but we don't consider it uh, anymore as a classical biocontrol. 
Excellent. And that's something that we may be able to talk about in our last session, webinar session um, in October. Um, I have a question here, sort of um, drawing together a few questions that have come through around uh, different approaches. How important is it to use uh, classical biocontrol or to consider that um, in conjunction with other approaches, other biocontrol approaches? Well, of course, uh, classical biocontrol is perfectly suitable uh, with, uh, with other control approach. Of course, uh, if you are using uh, a broad spectrum pesticides, uh, that's not really compatible because you will also affect uh, the introduced natural enemies. But of course, yes, it has to be part of, a, of an IPM approach. In some cases, in quite, in quite many cases, it was the, the only uh, control method that was used at the end because, uh, uh, because it, it fully controlled the pest. But we are not in, in that stage in the fall army worm. And with fall army worm, I don't think that it will be the case. Uh, we will always need uh, uh, an IPM approach. Uh, but if we can, if uh, the introduction of a natural enemy, of an exotic natural enemy can help uh, of course, uh, this this has to be really uh, considered. Excellent, Mark. Um, Mark, there are quite a few questions that have come through. We need to move on to our next speaker. I'm not sure if you'll be able to see the, in the Q&A. You may, if you go into that, click onto that, you can actually see some of the written questions coming through and we'll come back and answer those in the panel session um, as well. But if you do get the chance and you can see them, if you can write any replies, um, that would be most helpful. Yes, Thank I you, can Mark. do. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mark. And if you could turn your video off now, yeah. um, I will introduce the next speaker. And Charuwa Taikul, are you are you on the call right now? If you could just put your um, just if you could just put your video on just quickly. Yeah, I'm, I'm Excellent. doing it right now. So you can and turn it off. You can turn it off for the presentation, but we can hear you and we can see you. So um, uh, just tell me to move the slides when you're ready. And um, I'll just introduce you quickly. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome you to, to, the, to the webinar. Charawat has spent eight years working um, at the Biological Control Research Group at the Department of Agriculture in Thailand before um, finishing his master's and PhD, focusing on parasitoid wasps. And currently his focus is on parasitoids and grasshoppers for conservation and utilization. And he joins us today to talk about classical control in Thailand. Hi everyone, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, we I believe. can. Okay, great. So uh, today I'm gonna talk about the classical control in Thailand and the uh, potential for, for biological control. And uh, the outline of my talk, uh, including our successful case and the challenge with uh, for armyworm biocontrol management. The first one is uh, pink cassava mainly bark. And then the next one is coconut leaf beetle and uh, coconut blackhead caterpillar. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. As a government regulation, before uh, we introduce natural enemies uh, to the countries, certain study need to be made uh, as well as after they're imported. Uh, before we introduce a natural enemy, the study of insect plant interaction and the study of capacity uh, to affect other native species. For example, uh, the hyperparasitoid and uh, the attack of beneficial insects and uh, are they likely to become pest? After we import, we also have a research on inve investigation of the contamination, uh, specificity of uh, the natural enemies, the study biology and behavior under quarantine environment. Next slide, please. So uh, the first case that I would like to, to talk is pink cassava millibug. The outbreak has been reported uh, in 2008 is around uh, 48,000 per hectare uh, had been outbreak of pink cassava millibug. And then the number reached higher in 2009, 230,000 hectare. So of course, insecticide could not uh, keep it under control at that time. So we uh, introduced Anagelas lopisai 
from uh, International Institute of uh, Tropical Agriculture, Benin, in September 2009. At that time, we introduced 500 samples. Uh, we test for host specificity uh, for the sick beneficial insect and egg test. For, for mass wearing, uh, we used mealybugs. We are on cassava plant and later develop on pumpkin. Uh, next slide, please. This is the picture of uh, the one that we use uh, conventional rearing on cassava method first. It's developed on pumpkin later because we found out that they can reduce cost of parasitoid production. Uh, as you see at the bottom of the slide is the pumpkin and the cassava millibug. All right, next slide please. So for the activity that have, uh, we, we done uh, for field release, after having permit in July 2010, uh, the recommendation we observed uh, 300 pairs we, per hectare, we relieved 300 pairs per hectare. And then for heavy infestation occur, we released uh, 1,250 pairs per hectare. The most important part is technology transfer. We have a training course. Uh, training courses for rearing. So 44 parasitoid rearing unit established uh, at the Department of Agriculture and Department of Agriculture Extension, Thailand Tapioca Institu Institution at the Kasawa Flower uh, Factory. And the successful case that we found more than uh, 15 million 600,000 pairs of parasitoid released during 2010 uh, to March 2012, the outbreak area will reduce to uh, 4,000 hectares and helping the cassava farmer and Thai tapioca industries. Next slide, please. So the next phase that I'm going to talk about is uh, coconut leaf beetle. Coconut leaf beetle uh, reported outbreak in 2004. The great impact to coconut plantation in Thailand so at that time, we introduced uh, Asicodes hispinarum uh, from Vietnam in 2004. We uh, got supported uh, by FAO and Nong Lam University. The mass rearing of the horse and the parasitoid were cultured in laboratory using coconut leaves. Next slide, please. So uh, for the horse, we use mature leaf for larva. We use a young leaf for adults. And for Asicodes, the parasitoid, uh, we have 80 to 100 larvae of, uh, of the horse and 50 adults of parasitoid kept in a plastic container uh, for parasitization. Next slide, please. So as you see from the slide, after parasitization, the larvae of the coconut uh, beetle are killed, turn to be black. And in the container, 20% honey solution smear on tissue paper was provided as food of the parasitoid adult. And then when the mummy are collected and released after parasitization for 10 days, 90% released in the infested area, but we keep, we keep 10% for stock culture. Next slide, please. So for activity we have been done uh, for field release, we are releasing 30 to 60 pupae per hectare for three times with uh, seven to 10 days interval depending on the damage. So uh, as uh, earlier, technology transfer is very important. We have been transferred uh, to DOA Research and Development Center and Department of Agriculture Extension Insectary as well. After we release the parasitoid, uh, they can establish three years later, coconut leaf beetle no longer become pest outbreak in Thailand. Next slide, please. So the last pest that we are going to talk about the successful case is coconut blackhead caterpillar or Opicinia orionocella. The outbreak has been reported, uh, outbreak in 2007, around uh, 11, thousand hectare, approximately 5.56% of coconut plantation. Insecticide is not suitable for sustainable control. So at, we introduced uh, Goniosus nifatidis, uh, introduced from Sri Lanka in 2012. It has been considered as a potential parasitoid in India that we, are, uh, we will research and introduce uh, this guy to Thailand. So the mass rearing we uh, raised 
goniosus using both coconut blackhead caterpillar and rice moth caterpillar. And then after we do the research, we found out that um, the rice moth caterpillar uh, is more effect efficiency to use uh, as a rearing host. Next slide, please. This is the picture of uh, we, we do research. We are with both coconut blackhead caterpillar and we are with the rice moth caterpillar. But right now, we only use the rice moth caterpillar. Next slide, please. This is the rearing process. We made in parasitoid for four days and we gently removed the female parasitoid into the container, having single uh, rice moth caterpillar and keep container at room temperature. And then we maintain pupae parasitoid for 14 to 15 days before uh, reaching an adult, and then uh, mating adult for four days before releasing. All right, next slide, please. And the activity we have been done, uh, we're releasing 200 female per ride every seven days continuously for a month. And we find out that the more releasing, the more having effective result that we are going to, to uh, hear about augmentative later on. So for the technology transfer, technology has been transferred to Department of Agriculture Research and Development Office Center across the country and uh, DOAE uh, in sector as well. So the successful cases after Goniosa's established for three years later, coconut leaf beetle no longer become pest outbreak in Thailand. So next slide, please. Okay, we come to the challenge that we are going to talk today about the fall armyworm in Thailand. So since the outbreak of uh, fall armyworm in Thailand around, uh, around late December 2018, uh, DOA, DOA generates the urgent control project to manage the pest, both uh, chemical control and biological control. There are several experiments for, bio, uh, for the biological control. So we found out that the efficacy of sting bug and Bacillus thuringiensis or BT can control the forearmy worm effectively. So at the recommendation that, uh, that we have is early in star larva, we used BT at 80 gram uh, per liter. And at uh, sting bug, we released 500 adults uh, per ride per time after uh, 30 days planting. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. As a taxonomist, I, I asked, I heard about the, the attack Thailand in 2018. So I asked the government for the classical control. I asked my director about import certain parasitoid uh, from outside uh, the country. And my director and all staff here recommend me to, uh, we need to know what we have first as a native species. So as a parasitoid taxonomist, I went out at the field and collect, spend like uh, a year to collect uh, the, the, the eggs at the field. And then I found that uh, they have a certain parasitoid that we have. We have a uh, telenomas, yeah, the black one, that I work together with uh, Dr. Poleshek, Dr. Andrew Poleshek at British Museum. And then we found uh, the white one, as you see from the picture, is a trichogramma. The black one is telenomas uh, remus from morphology, but I need molecular evidence to support uh, that uh, telenomas or not. And then, uh, we also found Kilonas insularis, the Braconid parasitoid that, that we have here in the field in Thailand. So my point, our challenge is how to rear them and how to rear mass production of them as much as we can and then release. Uh, so I think we, we have the one that we need to, to import already. Right now, we just need uh, the process how to rear them. Uh, next slide, please. I think I finished for my talk today uh, regarding to the successful case and the challenge of for army work in Thailand. Thank you so much, uh, Charawat. That was an excellent presentation. I, oh, I really liked you. all the pictures as well of the uh, of how it all worked um, with the parasitoid. Uh, Great. Um, we have lots of questions coming through. Uh, so I hope you're ready. Some of them um, might be actually answered in the panel session, so we may not get to everyone's question. Um, I have a question here. Actually, 
it, how costly um, is it to do this work? I mean, is, is it extremely costly? Does it take a lot of resources? What, what's your views on that? If you would... ask, ask me again, please. Sorry, if you were to look at a um, specific project on, on developing this further, a particular mm -hmm. parasitoid, how mm -hmm. costly, uh, is it very expensive to do that work or is it something that's quite cost effective? What, what are your views on that? Uh, the challenge, the further research that we need to do is uh, we need to find out the way to mass rearing Yep. Uh, the the the, paras the effective parasitoid, both Telenomas rimas and uh, Chilonas insularis, yeah, and and because of the specificity as well, so the cost is is about the uh, the laboratory testing, and we still need a survey more, more survey because these two species, these two species that I found, I found only the small area in central part of Thailand. We have yet uh, keep, uh, brought it, uh, keep my keep our eye open to other area across the country. So the cost is might be, I'm not sure. It might be, it might be not high and not low, something like that. That's that's a good answer. Not not high and not low. <laughs> Sounds just right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a question here from uh, Pierre Sylvie. Uh, Unfortunately, it seems that once the exotic species, the parasitoid, have been judged as successful, there are no more projects funded to follow the long-term effects. Is that so in Thailand or in your opinion? What are your thoughts on that? Do you think that that about the farmy worm or, or the pest? I think just in general in, in that um, once there's been a successful project, do you follow up uh, as, a, as a part of the research and looking at the long-term effects of any introduced species? Or an introduced... Uh, uh, Alison, I, you mean you mean at beside the four army worm, right? Exactly. So, or, or, or the long term one. Yeah, once you introduce, I guess in general, once you introduce a new parasitoid to your country, uh -huh. for example, uh -huh. do you ensure do do you follow up long term potentially what is what is we, happening we are, with it? We are doing it right now. I mean, yep. uh, we have we have uh, I mean uh, the center of. Agriculture, uh, Department of Agriculture has eight centers around uh, across the country, and then uh, we have the the farmer and researcher in that area, and they submit the number to to the government to us yeah. to the center, and then uh, they also have the the know how I mean the expert the the mass rearing technique with them, so the right now I think everything keep it in under control for these three phases. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, now, here's another question um, from Fernandes Macal or Macale. The, um, he uh, she, he's saying there, there's been slow uptake or adoption of biocontrol, especially by many smallholder farmers in Africa due to fear of non-target effects or due to low awareness or slow action of the biological control agents. What do you think is the best approach in achieving adoption and scale with smallholder farmers and using biocontrol options? Oh, this is a very good question. Uh, I talk with my friend or my staff and uh, the director here uh, how to how to use it in the small farm or the small farmer if we have a big amount uh, a big population of pests so the first thing they're thinking of the chemical control right and the four army worm as well for the high density we use chemical first but for the low the low uh, Pace population, we can use biocontrol to to control it. So keep in mind that before using the chemical, we need to consider the IPM first, and then put the biocontrol as the main focus on that process. Try to reduce the chemical control, and then you will maintain such sustainable uh, system into your small farm. 
Excellent. And that's a very, that's a very good ending for the session. We've got many, many questions. If you can jump on the Q&A, you may be able to um, see some of those questions and feel free to type a few answers. But you okay. will be joining us later on in the, the panel session where we will get a chance to ask you all uh, the questions that have not been asked so far. So thank you for a wonderful presentation. Um, okay. And I, I will move on to our next speaker, Dr. Rika Joy Floor from IRI, who's going to be talking about exploring sustainable options for fall armyworm management in, in Cambodia. Rika, can you um, join us? Yes. Uh, Alison, do you hear me? Yes, I do. Loud and clear. Okay. So you can start. Thank right. you very much. Thank you, Alison. And good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we are indeed, uh, this presentation is about a case of just exploring coming from a country where biocontrol is not very common in Cambodia. And uh, next slide, please. And you can skip this one. Yes. So um, let me preface this presentation with the why question. Coming from Erie uh, Rice background, why is this relevant to us? Um, in Cambodia, we are currently doing a project together with the IPM Innovation Lab and, and many government partners um, looking at ecologically based pest management, which is developing a package that can harness insights from the ecology and behavior of different pests and thereby uh, helping farmers to reduce their reliance on pesticides. And with this project, we wanted to support innovations, particularly bringing out these alternatives to pesticides, sustainable uh, ways to manage pests, um, especially uh, biological control, which is uh, very limited in Cambodia at present. And we are also uh, looking into sustainable management of pest outbreaks. And so this presentation is exploring uh, fall army war management with our partners, but as such, it is not a classical biocontrol. Um, yeah, so next slide, please. When fall army worm was uh, expected to arrive uh, in Southeast Asia, one of the initial activities that we did was to look into um, surveillance and, and looking at whether the pest is already present and what are the natural enemies that potentially may be uh, existing. And after collection of some fall armyworm eggs, uh, the General Directorate of Agriculture tried to um, culture these um, eggs and look at whether there are parasitoids that would emerge out of this. And they found uh, some telenomo species uh, from this one. Uh, but we know that this is only the first step. Um, next slide, please. We are interested, and, and next, yes. We are interested in what are the currently available options in Cambodia? Uh, there are, at the moment, uh, not many options for commercial uh, biological control that the farmers can easily access with. And, and we know that uh, farmers would often resort to pesticides. Uh, next one. So we tried an experiment where we looked at first, uh, what if the farmers did nothing as one treatment control. Uh, also, we surveyed uh, corn growers in an area that uh, has some, uh, has seen some incidents of fall armyworm damage. And we asked the farmers, what is their current practice for managing the pest? And the most common one was just applying insecticides, specifically emamectin benzoate and uh, making a, it a double application in, in one season. So this was the most common. But we also looked at what does the pesticide seller, what do these companies uh, also from the literature that's being brought out to the farmers, what is being recommended out there? And the recommendation was uh, to alternate pesticide. It's still majorly pesticide. Uh, it's chlorantinilipril and then followed by emamectin, and again, a third application of chlorantinilipril. So we look at then, in terms of commercial biocontrol that is available in Cambodia, perhaps we can test one, and that is Boveria basiana, is or all, also um, available in Cambodia, mostly imported from, from India. And uh, we had a treatment that, is applying Boveria three times in the season. Uh, next slide, please. From this uh, experiment, we found that 
uh, biological control has high infestation uh, compared with the pesticide options, but um, also um, a bit lower compared with uh, doing nothing. And we also found in terms of yield, um, one more please, yes. In terms of yield, we found that um, the biocontrol application using Bavaria had a little bit higher yield than the three other treatments. So we are seeing that maybe it is it has potential, but we also wanted to see whether this um, result can be replicated. So we tested it again. And next slide, please. And the question this time was, um, oh, one more thing. Um, we also looked at, of course, the, the farmers would be interested in looking at biological control if they can access it and also whether it, is, uh, it makes sense from an economic perspective to the farmers. And when we looked at um, production costs, biological control is expensive because it's uh, not very common in Cambodia, mostly sold in the capital. Um, it's not the, the normal pesticide that you can find from a village seller. So that makes the, the, the economics of it um, a little bit uh, not so compat competitive to the pesticide options. But if you examine the net profit, it might be better than um, using uh, three applications of pesticides per season. Uh, next slide. We wanted to then uh, test this again but this time also examine whether a reduced uh, number of biocontrol applications, uh, thereby reducing costs, would be more effective. So we added, uh, one more please, Alison. We added one treatment, which is uh, biocontrol uh, using, again, uh, still Bogveria basiana, but this time application two times per season. And next slide, please. Uh, this is still uh, freshly harvested. We have not yet uh, collected or, or summarized the yield uh, data, but uh, we are seeing similar trend in damage scores. And uh, in terms of uh, comparing it again, uh, pesticides uh, much lower, uh, doing nothing much higher. But we're also seeing there's a bit of difference between whether you apply two times uh, Bavaria Bastiana or, or three times of the biocontrol, uh, three applications per season in terms of uh, the damage score um, over time. So uh, what we're seeing is uh, perhaps if, uh, if uh, Bavaria Bastiana were to be used, um, it would have to be um, adjusted in terms of perhaps uh, tweaking the applications or, or maybe uh, we will need to explore other types of biological control and that's where we are at the moment. Uh, next slide, please. We wanted to also survey um, other natural enemies, uh, other parasitoids, um, uh, perhaps predators that exist um, in the corn areas, also maybe other entomopathogenic fungi, and then um, try to test the effectiveness of, of these uh, collected natural enemies. Uh, at the moment, the General Directorate of Agriculture is still continually uh, continuing the mass rearing of Telenomus, and we're going to explore uh, whether we can do a mass release of this uh, fall armyworm parasitoid and um, examine the efficacy of this mass release. So uh, that said, uh, next slide, please. These are um, the different partners that are working on, on this with us. And um, I, my colleague, uh, Ms. Liberty Almazan, is also here, and we would be happy to um, answer your question. Excellent. Thank you very much, Rika. Um, that was a, a very interesting um, presentation, and it was nice. We've had two sort of uh, focus presentations on classical biocontrol and it was nice to sort of end with that um, almost an introduction to biocontrol of, of the process that you've gone through to sort of start thinking about what could be the approaches that could be used in Cambodia. Um, so that was a very nice way to end. I know there's going to be lots of questions um, coming up uh, on your presentation. So Liberty, have you joined us on the, on the 
the speaker, if you could unmute yourself, because I think you might want to answer questions uh, as yes, well. Yes, I'm here. Yes, I'm here. Welcome. So Liberty is going to um, join uh, Rika for um, this Q&A session, and I'm just going to bring up the question and answers for myself. So sorry, the questions, so I can see them. And here they are now. Okay, so oh, we've got lots coming in. Um, firstly, I've got a lot of questions about farmers and, and how do we get farmers to think about biocontrol? How do we get them to um, consider using it? Uh, I guess it's you, you're actually the perfect people to sort of answer that question from your social science perspective. What are your thoughts on that, Rika? Uh, thank you so much. I think that there has to be several prongs with which we uh, help the farmers to access or to be aware of biological control. Um, the first one is on the policy side, where uh, indeed we've been talking about regulation for classical biocontrol, but there's also regulation in terms of selling and trading biological control, which is very important in countries where uh, they're, they're still starting uh, at a baseline. Uh, the products are not yet there. To help the market to develop these products and to make them available to farmers in a cheaper way, uh, that sort of regulatory policy context has to be ready. Uh, we're also looking at, of course, the state of knowledge. Uh, to what extent is your extension uh, system supporting uh, these options and how much knowledge uh, is available or being brought out to the farmers uh, in a way that farmers can access it? Um, lastly, also um, accessibility at the local level of these options. Um, we're, we're seeing, uh, for example, in Cambodia, kind of competition um, where the farmers are, are easily able to access pesticide, easily able to access the, the um, recommendations from pesticide sellers, easily able to see that uh, pesticide is the most uh, convenient or maybe the better option for them. So then that really leaves out your biocontrol technologies um, on the side. So if uh, perhaps uh, you have several prongs of strategies that need to be addressed and all these together help the farmers to access and, and be able to um, use it and see that it has benefits. Excellent. Thank you very much. That's a great answer. And yeah, I can, I, can I add to that also? Yes, please. Uh, yeah, um, I think it's uh, very important to create awareness in farmers that there are other options other than the pesticides, other than the insecticides. Okay, if we can, if, if we can um, um, let farmers know uh, these are other options that would give us benefit in terms of um, non-target organi organisms in terms of the health of the environment and the safety of the ones or humans using it, then uh, I think farmers will be enlightened and um, uh, try these other options. Yes, thank you. Yep. Thank you for that. Now, I've got some specific questions here around um, why did you only use Bassiana? Um, did you try any other isolate to know the efficacy? Thank you is the question from uh, one, of our, one of our participants. Okay, uh, thanks for that. Uh, we used Bavaria Basiana because it was the only commercially available option in Cambodia that we know if uh, the, the research would show that this is a good option for farmers, we can immediately recommend it at a national level that this exists and you can buy it. So that's where we started with Bavaria Basiana. Well, that, that sounds like that's a good place to start, given that it seems it's the only available option. Um, so you didn't have too many options to choose from. But here's some more questions following that up. What particular stage of the plant did you apply the Bassiana? Uh, so the Bovaria Bassiana was timed uh, um, three, in three spaces. So the first one was two weeks uh, after planting, and then every two weeks thereafter. Um, so it wasn't uh, so much, an, uh, and uh, I had a discussion with uh, Dr. Buyung Hali, and he mentioned that perhaps uh, one way to uh, maybe see better if Bavaria would work is to um, adjust the timing, not so much uh, find uh, in, in this stage, but perhaps to look at um, the, the cycle of the, of the 
full army worm and, and target it better. Excellent, thank you. When, um, here's another question. When spraying of pesticides is keeping the fall army worm levels lower, why do you think the yields are lower? Did you check? Uh, I think for, for that one, um, one of the things that we discussed was perhaps although the damage on the leaf or on the plant, uh, looking at control, looking at uh, bio, bio control option, th those treatments, Perhaps the damage on the plant was was there, but the the yield the plant itself was able to recover from this, um, because we do not see also during that time we did not see um, other uh, problems on on the corn itself compared to this season. For example, we saw fall smut, we saw uh, stem borers. So, but for that previous season we did not. So we we think that perhaps. Uh, during that season, the corn was able to recover more. Okay, excellent. Okay, another question here. We've got some very specific questions. It's, it's generated a lot of interest. What dose of Boveria bassiana did you use in the experiment? There we go. We're really getting down to the specifics here. Um, dose of Boveria bassiana. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think we used uh, 250. 250 grams per if we convert it it would be 250 grams per hectare um, per application because okay. we only then used um, and in the end it was more like 750 grams um, per hectare Okay, great. And, and if you um, want to add to that, I, I think um, you'll be able to see in the Q&A uh, questions, you might be able to provide some further feedback, but there's obviously a lot of interest, Rika, on this. Um, I've got a question here which is a little bit different. Have you surveyed whether there is any fall armyworm infestation on rice? Uh, yes, we are very keen to, to hear about this. I must say we did not do a field survey as such. We are also, um, depending on our partners um, in the provinces to be who are aware of uh, fall armyworm on corn, but there has been no report that there's any um, uh, infestation or damage of fall armyworm on rice so far in our uh, four provinces where we work. So um, hopefully it stays that way. Yes, let's hope so. Um, here's a question from Cyril Tura. It is, is it possible to combine botanicals to control fall, fall armyworm with parasitoids? Perhaps you can have a go at, at answering that, Rika or uh, Liberty? Maybe uh, Liberty, Liberty? <laughs> would Liberty have better? <laughs> uh, I think uh, you, you can combine because botanicals are, are uh, from natural sources. So I think it would uh, work hand in hand with the biological control agents. Okay, thank you very much. Um, here's another question for what uh, for for either of you. What rating scale did you use for the fall armyworm infestation scoring? Uh, yes, we followed the FAO uh, scale, the the one in the biocontrol guidelines of FAO. Excellent. Okay, um, how can we, oh, here's a, now here's a, here's a question here. Other than plant damage, sorry, I, I'm trying to read the questions and, and ask them at the same time. Did you collect the insect cadavers to confirm the infection by the Boveria um, bassiana? Uh, you mean the cadavers of the fall army were? Yes. Uh, no, we did not collect these. Okay, um, the next one was uh, here, do the farmers accept this method in, in Cambodia? I, I think you alluded to this a little bit in your presentation. You definitely talked about the, the farmer uptake, but maybe a little bit more insight into how easy is it for farmers to, to actually apply or use this, this method? Um, we have uh, tried in our other experiments for rice, we have tried uh, working with farmers using Boveria bassiana um, for rice. 
uh, in some cases, uh, particularly in areas where they were used to spraying insecticide and then they realized that, oh, there are safe alternatives and I don't have to spray it so much and now I'm seeing the yields are okay. Um, after uh, two seasons, the farmers were uh, quite uh, happy with this. Uh, part of the, the biggest disincentive was just the cost and the accessibility of Bavaria. Yeah, excellent. Okay, thank you. And one more question here, and I think we'll then go into our panel session. But I have here a question um, from Srinivas. What was the trigger for spraying or applying treatments, or is it calendar-based? It is calendar-based. Yeah, and perhaps uh, that is also something that we might need to reflect on um, moving moving forward, whether there might be other triggers that that are better. Um, but but uh, because, uh, for example, for the pesticide treatment, we surveyed it from the farmers or, or from the pesticide sellers, and they were also calendar based uh, in, in that sense. Oh, that's very interesting. Actually, I just have one more question I'm going to squeeze in into your session. Um, here's the last question on the Q&As coming through. Do you have a sense on rice or maize farmers' perception on biopesticides in Cambodia? Do they find it safer or more effective, efficacious? Uh, my, my sense is at the very beginning, there's a lot of skepticism for uh, things that are not being sprayed. Uh, but spraying in general as a skill, as a practice, uh, is, is quite accepted. So if it's biopesticides, uh, that spraying, uh, it might be, there might be a bit of openness for it. But then um, when it comes then to um, uh, looking at pesticide safety, there is a lot of, of farmers that really say, oh, we would like other options that are not pesticides. But again, they, they would then encounter cost issues. They would encounter um, issues about accessibility, um, credit from the pesticide sellers. Uh, these things, the farmers balance uh, among, among these uh, decision points. Excellent. Thank you very much. And thank you very much to both of you. Um, if you can stay on, we're going to have a panel discussion now. Uh, we have lots of questions still unanswered and some of them have been answered. But if anyone else has now burning questions to, answer, to ask any one of our panelists today, um, please start putting those um, questions in the question and answer um, uh, box. If you've got something to add and you want to say it verbally, we may be able to give you the chance to if you put your hand up. Um, so, so please think about that as well if you're brave enough to take on the panel verbally. Um, good luck. But if Mark and um, Chara Watts, could you, could you join us, please? Yeah. Yeah, yes. I am. Yeah, Excellent. Yeah. We have all of you there. Thank you very much for coming back. Uh, we, as you can see, I, I, I see some people have already answered some questions. Mark, I, I think I saw a, you, you'd already addressed a few. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, I've got a question for all of you. Um, and perhaps we could start with um, Mark. And this is a pretty wide ranging question here. So you've got the hard one to start with. Um, what do you think is the potential for classical biocontrol methods in Southeast Asia over the next five years? Well, yeah, as I said, uh, I think it's worth trying because uh, it is something that uh, is sometimes difficult to predict the success. But once it is uh, successful, I, uh, that's the very good thing because you don't have very much to do after it. Uh, um, and uh, so, yes, I think, I think we should try. And also, as I, as I explained, uh, even partial success would be immensely useful here if we just can reduce uh, by you know, 30% the use of, uh, of insecticides just by classical biocontrol, that would be wonderful already. Excellent. Thank you, Mark. Um, I have uh, a question here, Chara. What actually? Maybe I can ask you the same question. What What do you think, from your perspective of the work you have done so far and the success stories in Thailand with classical biocontrol? What do you think is the potential for the next five years on fall armyworm control using the classical approach? Yeah, there are more than more than uh, one the parasitoid that we introduce into our field. If there are 
several scenario to take it into account. For example, with you, when you, you introduce parasitoid into the field, we need to reduce the use of insecticide. We need to reduce the pesticide and put more biocontrol. For example, the Bivaria, the BT, the NPV, or, or other natural enemies try to, because the parasitoid is very sensitive to the chemical, right? So uh, the successful case need to come together with the IPM. Excellent, thank you. Okay. Um, Rika, a question for you. There's lots of different organizations and people and experts that are working across uh, Southeast Asia uh, in, in labs or out in the environment and also internationally. How do we bring these people together um, in a more efficient way, do you think? Uh, do you feel like you're connected to what's happening uh, across Southeast Asia? I must say that there is a tendency for, for researchers to uh, work together because of their, their natural connections. They already know each other. Um, I think uh, where we are connected, for example, with the IPM Innovation Lab, we get to know um, other colleagues in Nepal and Bangladesh uh, also working on this. Um, so then we find out about their work. So it, it goes with a, like a natural connection, uh, personal connections of, of the different researchers. And I think that's always the, the fallback uh, situation. But, but I have a feeling that where there's, uh, for example, this kind of uh, more specific topics, uh, classical biocontrol, biopesticide, things like this, then there's uh, a lot more interest uh, specifically to engage with other scientists and to get to know what they're doing. And I think that's a starting point. Thanks, Rika. Chara, what, what, what do I, you... I agree with her. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, because I know that there's, there's a lot of other interest in a lot of uh, the Southeast Asian countries. I know Vietnam is doing a lot of work and is very interested as well. And, I, and I'm sure there, there is um, just looking at the questions that are coming through on this chat forum and the question and answers section. I mean, there's people from across Southeast Asia here asking all sorts of detailed questions. The interest is there. How do we, how do we um, harness that more, do you think? How do we what? How do we, how do we um, amplify that interest more and get people working together on this? Um, are you connected, for example, into other laboratories and, and work across Southeast Asia? I mean, uh, currently we have a connection. I know people from Cambodia, from Vietnam. We have, we have yeah, like, like uh, Dr. Rika said about we have the initiate starting point, the good starting point right now that we, we know people in Southeast Asia right now. We know the center. Uh, the, next, the next step, as we do in Thailand, we, the successful case in Thailand, we try to, we, are, we, we try to do it in the center in Bangkok of Thailand, and then we transfer the knowledge uh, across the country through the cent uh, DOA center across the country. And we do the same thing. If uh, each country in Southeast Asia have the, the pilot project or the pilot grade project, they can share and distribute and help a whole continent to get success together. Yes, that's a good idea. And I think that's something we could work on in the ASEAN action plan is to bring some of those pilots together to share what is happening um, yeah. and make sure that does happen, which I'm, I'm sure it will. Um, I've got a specific question here around, um, it's, it's actually back to you, Rika. It's around, does calendar spraying increase cost? Um, I must say that uh, in... Cambodia, the perspectives that I'm hearing is that um, where it, it seems like the pesticide companies are, are saying, oh, calendar spraying uh, will uh, keep the farmers to this number of sprays to this correct pesticides. But um, if you look at also the practice of farmers, they are also quite um, efficient, uh, really considering their own costs. So as much as possible, as much as they can, they also want to limit the cost. So, so 
I think where the farmers are oriented with IPM, they are looking, uh, are, are able to look more into the natural enemies and, and uh, base their, their pesticide spraying on, on that knowledge. But where there are farmers that are really depending on the pesticide sellers, um, their costs are much higher because uh, the pesticide seller is not only uh, telling them uh, calendar spraying, it's also mixed in every uh, application of pesticide. Excellent. Thank you, Rika. Uh, a question, Charawat from Singapore here. Are the parasitoids commercially available or are they developed internally by the Department of Agriculture and distributed to farmers for use? Uh, I mean, for, for other, other pairs besides four, besides, yes, yes. besides these three pairs. We, not, we working on, on some parasitoid, but, but it's not quite uh, have a great impact or successful yet. Yeah, we have some. And uh, right now we introduce uh, the mite, spider mite from Netherlands. Yeah, but we are going to, we are working on it. We not yet uh, get the get the successful, yeah. Thank you. And Mark, there was a question before um, that that has come up again. Um, I, I, it's this question of uh, how much research happens after you introduce a a, a, a species. Um, how much research is sort of ongoing into the future? So it may be very successful, but are there checks to make sure that uh, there's knowledge around what is actually happening uh, going forward? Do you mean after the success or? Yeah, so say, say we, you introduce a parasite, predator or pathogen, and is there ongoing checks to sort of see uh, what is happening, e even <coughs> though it could be very successful, just to ensure that you have got that host specificity, I guess, in, in the long term and not uh, any leakage yeah. to non-target species. Yeah. What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, this is a major problem, is that uh, usually donors Either they are happy uh, uh, because it worked very well and they, and they want to spend money on something else or uh, they are not happy because it didn't work and they don't want to spend more money on something that first failed. So there are lots of uh, biocontrol projects that end up with the release without follow-up uh, releases. And this is a major issue uh, in, in all continents uh, with classical biocontrol. And uh, yes, no, that's, that's uh, usually these things are, these studies are taken over by um, more academic grants uh, at national level. Okay, so that's an important consideration, I guess, in the yeah. design of any release uh, of, uh, in, in classical biocontrol, yes. is those long-term um, Okay, uh, work that goes with it. I've got another question here and I'm not sure who would like to answer this. Maybe I'll throw it out there. <laughs> we'll see who answers first. Um, we've collected some parasitoid from egg mass, from the egg mass of fall armyworm. Where could we send that to have molecular identification? Mark. Well, if it's, if it's on fall armyworm, we are welcoming any uh any uh, parasitoids for molecular identification for the moment. I'm not sure how long it will, it can last, but uh, yes, for the moment we can, we can try to identify them. Yes. So that's, that, that's possible. Of course, there are countries where it is e not easy to uh, get uh, parasitoids or other insects out of the countries because of uh, national uh, regulations. But okay. of course, of, of course it depends on the, on the country. Okay, so we know who that person is. So what we might do is it sounds like, Mark, you're offering to maybe um, n not do, do anything specific, but at, at least um, we'll, get, we'll, we'll um, pass on your details and perhaps they can have that conversation with you um, offline as well. So uh, we can do that as well if anyone's got any specific questions. Um, now, I've got a question for Rika. Uh, there's, there's a lot of questions uh, here around your bovaria. Um, 
In this case, maybe the host may be affected by other natural enemies. How do you estimate or know that it's from the Boveria bassiana? Rika. I, I, I must say that we did not uh, measure the uh, other parameters of, of um, other uh, natural enemies or other uh, potential uh, things that might compete with the effect of Bavaria um, in the first season. Um, in the current season, we uh, collected some uh, parameters for just uh, documenting what are the other um, insects that are present as they are collecting the damage data, um, but I haven't yet seen uh, this uh, full set of data in the second season, so I'm not, not sure um, how to answer this. Excellent. Well, thank you for, for giving that a go, Rika. Um, I've got a question here for Charawat. Is the DOA Centre doing some work on intimate pathogenic fungi to control fall armyworm in Thailand? You mean the using blue warrior or the other fungi to control to yes. control for army worm? We are doing it right now, but uh, uh, last year, but uh, the effectiveness is not is not quite as as good as a BT Bacillus thuringiensis. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you for the answer. Mark, I have a question for you. Although you published a very interesting article on Talinomus remus, um, I have noticed that you didn't support using egg parasitoid and classical control in your talk today. Could you just give a brief response to that? And your, your microphone is off, Mark, so I'll just get you to turn it on. Oh, yes. I was, I was switching off because I was answering this particular question and I didn't want to hear. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. No, so I will, I will answer orally. Well, uh, indeed, but it, of course, this is because Telenomus remus is already present in Africa and Asia. So there is yes. no need for introduction as classical biocontrol agent. It can be studied and potentially be used as augmentative biocontrol through mass uh, and regular releases. Uh, but for the moment in Latin America, when we are going in, uh, when we are serving uh, egg parasitoids, we cannot find any specific or almost specific egg parasitoids in Latin America. So we are not considering egg parasitoids for introduction uh, as classical biocontrol agent for the moment. Okay, thank you, Mark. And thank you. I, I must have been reading your mind seeing that you were answering that question. Um, I'm going to end with uh, a question to Charawat and Rika. Um, uh, firstly, just to, to congratulate all the panelists, this person says, for your excellent presentations. But they would like to ask a broader question. What are the two things you would recommend we should do as part of the ASEAN Fall Armyworm Action Plan in enabling bio biocontrol as a major component of the control strategy. So what would be the two big things you would recommend we should do as part of the ASEAN Fall Army Worm strategy? Who would like to start? Rika, I'm going to put you in the hot seat there. Okay, I, I can think of one uh, right one now. One is okay. Think, <laughs> yeah, I think that uh, at the moment at the top level, even at the level of the government, the regulators, the, the researchers of, of the national systems, um, in many countries, uh, they are still not uh, oriented with biocontrol and, and what it can do, how much, uh, what is the effect, um, what are the potential risks. And I think that is an area where uh, we first target because uh, these uh, are the, the people that will continue the research and also uh, bring out extension messages later on. So I think uh, that's an area that we should also prioritize. I think that's a, that's a great answer. And um, just that, that one in itself is totally enough, I think, for, for a start there. Chara, what, do you have anything to add to that as a one or two, just briefly, you think are the key things we should be working on? The key thing is uh, we need, we, we come to the right track. We need to know each other. We need connection. I read the paper of Mark Kennis, but I never see him in person. Yeah, but right today, <laughs> I see him in person. So next step, I may write a letter to him talking about what other uh, effective parasitoids to control for army worm besides Telenomus remus. Yeah, so I know Rika today. Yeah, that is, that is the point is a good starting point to get connection in, in this region. 
and know each other and share the information and help each other. Yeah. It's Excellent. Well, that's, that's another brilliant answer there. Mark, I'll give you sort of what, from a sort of looking into the, the region and, and being an expert in this area of classical biocontrol, what would be your one thing that you think we should focus on? You can have two if you'd like to, but they have to be brief. Well, well I'm not a specialist of South Asia, Southeast Asia, so um, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to talk about, uh, you know, farmers and strategies and, and connections and so on, but just on a scientific point of view, uh, both for classical augmentative and conservation biocontrol, we, we need to have a very good... Uh, a data set of the natural enemies attacking fall armyworm presently in the different uh, ASEAN countries. So uh, that's that's the first step for all biocontrol strategies in terms of science. Of course, I know there are other uh, uh, there are other issues in terms of social science, in terms of politics, and so on. But in terms of pure science, I think that's the first step. Great, thank you very much. And thank you to all three of you today. Uh, I know it's been very fast and I thank you to everyone else. We've gone slightly over time, but I do want to just um, move to a quick summary from Roger Day. He's gonna be uh, very brief here and I'm sorry, Roger, for cutting your time off, but I think those summaries from our speakers there um, actually said a lot about um, where we could be looking um, for our next steps uh, on this work uh, in classical uh, and, and biocontrol in general. Roger, can you just join us quickly? Thank you, yes. Um, very, very interesting talks and, and obviously a lot of interest. We, I think we peaked at over 200 participants, which is fantastic, and, and lots of very pertinent questions. So, so there's clearly a lot of interest here. We need to find ways of continuing this discussion. And I think that's the, that's the main take home, I think. From, from the discussions, the importance of collaboration, which Charawak emphasized, uh, and indeed the other speakers have. Um, we need to collaborate at different levels between um, scientists in different countries, different regions, um, more so when we get to some of the other approaches between the private sector and the public sector. We need to collaborate between the scientists and the regulators, between the social and the natural scientists, so, so there's a various dimensions to collaboration which are critical for success in all these approaches. Classical biocontrol clearly has a lot of potential. We shouldn't look at it as the only possible approach. So all these other methods should be pursued, but classical biocontrol clearly has potential and, it, and we've seen that there's capacity in the region. So we should be building on the expertise that's already in ASEAN as well as the uh, the work they've already started. So, so I see this as a, an excellent uh, starting point and I look forward to the further events and collaborations that can be organized under the ASEAN plan. Thank you. Thank you so much, Roger. And I'm just gonna come back. I've got my friend behind me, as you can see, there's his face. Um, <laughs> Look, it's been a wonderful session. I, I really um, congratulate everyone for uh, presenting, but also participating and ask, asking lots of um, interesting questions. We will try and um, come back to you with some answers to those questions uh, in the next few days. Uh, and you will get a copy of the um, presentation. Um, just note that we do have a webinar next week on technology potential for drones and digital IPM, which will be interesting. And we have those other biocontrol sessions as well. So please join us. I'd just like to say thank you very much and thank you from ASEAN, um, Kabi and Grow Asia and Mad Vietnam, who is also the task force chair of the ASEAN Action Plan. And um, we wish you a very good evening or very good morning, depending on where you've joined us from. So thank you very much. And thank you, Mark, Tarawat, Brika and um, Roger, of course. Thank you very much. Okay, bye. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you.